Oh, hi. Welcome to BJ Investigates, a show I just created and might never do again. The following are all people who have been associated with Hillsong. Justin Bieber. Oh, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, but I never really implemented it mm. into my life. I never like was like, I'm gonna be obedient. God is here right now. He's in the midst of our pain and our struggle right now. I want you to put your hands up. Haley Baldwin, who's Bieber now. I found a church community that works for me where I feel supported and loved and accepted. And it's just acceptance and love and it's just pure and you feel that when you're there. I learned something so much from everyone that I've had on the show. And I think what I just took away from you is I'm allowed to decide what my relationship is with spirituality as an adult that doesn't have to be aligned with the way that it was when I was brought up because I was also brought up in a church in Tennessee at a time, you know, in the 90s. So it was a less accepting time. I had some gay friends in school that the reason I kind of left my church was because they weren't being accepted. They were being sent to conversion therapy. Uh, Kanye West. Do you pray to Kanye or to <laughs> God at this church? There's actually, there's no praying. There's no, no praying. sermon. There's no word. It's just music and it's just a feeling. Oh, but it's I Christian. God knocked me off my horse. God, like, literally called me and said, okay, now I need you. Kendall Jenner. VJB got spotted at a church gathering in New York City over the weekend, and apparently Kendall Jenner was also on hand for the ceremony, so obviously they must be dating, right? Kourtney Kardashian. We make for a good show. I think we do, huh? like, tweet a lot of spiritual things. Mm -hmm. I, I know I'll tweet, you know, like if I wake up one morning and I just feel spiritual, like, thank you, God, for opening my eyes to something, like, I'll tweet mm -hmm. that. And then, you know, so many people give a reaction. Selena Gomez. You are enough because you are a child of God who has been pursued from the very beginning. And many more. Okay, so now I have this section called Hillsong and like buckle up, girl. Brian, let's talk a little bit about him. Brian is the current president, CEO, whatever, leader of Hillsong. You're watching the Christian channel. Jesus is the Lord of the Airwaves. New from Pastor Brian Houston, money. There's not one person in this building who doesn't need more money. And if you say, well, I don't need more money, then I would say you have a very poor outlook on life. You'll learn why you need more money. Because money is a tool that can accomplish phenomenal things. What money can do in your head is bless, it can help, it can build, it can increase, it can bring vision, it can strengthen. Brian Houston is one of these like prosperity preachers that like thinks like the more money and flashy you are, the more God has favor on you. So he says, you need more money. This is the name of Brian's book. You need more money. God's amazing financial plan for your life. <laughs> As Frank's dark secrets gradually came to light, Brian slid slowly into a growing dependence on sleeping pills. Oh, okay. Frank Houston is the founder of Hillsong. Now, Hillsong was founded in Australia, which a lot of people don't necessarily know. Somebody said the patron saint of Hillsong was Gianni Versace. Say he fucking with my posse, caught me Chloe like Kardashian, keep this pussy in Versace. Hello, welcome back. These are pictures from uh, Miami where the fashion designer Gianni Versace has been shot dead. I think that that actually speaks to the excess and the extravagance of these Hollywood churches. You do see pastors driving Ferraris, wearing Balenciagas, Prada. I mean, they're paying themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars. Frank Houston is the founder of Hillsong. So when Frank was 78 years old, he told his son Brian, who ultimately would go on to take over Hillsong, that Frank's own father had abused him after coming home drunk. The man who saved Frank was a barnstorming Pentecostal preacher named Ray Bloomfield, who took him on as kind of an apprentice at a church near Auckland in the late 1950s. So that's how Hillsong got started. His father was abusing him and he got taken on, basically fostered by this Pentecostal 
preacher named Ray Bloomfield in the 50s. So then, of course, he starts this church later called Hillsong. As you probably know, Frank has been accused by members of the congregation of sex. The enormously popular Hillsong Church proudly boasts it believes in people and their ability to influence the world with good. It was founded by the telegenic and usually talkative Brian Houston, but he didn't want anything to do with this story. And that's because it's about evil. And his father, Frank Houston. He too was a high profile church leader, but used his position and influence to abuse children. I'd like to talk briefly about your, your experience with your father and the story you share in your book um, of when you found out that he'd abused children while he was in ministry and there were the pressures of the Royal Commission last year um, and then your, your father passed away a few years after all of this came out and I guess that you really lost a hero, not only your father. Um, I feel like I really only have in very recent times moved on. At the time I went into leadership mode in terms of our movement, of which at the time I was the president and, you know, of the church obviously, including our city campus where he was the pastor there for 22 years. The Royal Commission released the general manager of Hillsong's recollection of events to the public, and it paints an even more sinister portrait of the church. The following statement was made by George Agajanian, general manager of Hillsong Church Limited, as a recollection of events that occurred in the latter months of 1999. The initial allegation came via telephone call to Pastor Bill Johnston, now deceased, from a minister identifying himself as Mad Dog. As Mad Dog began to explain the allegations against Frank Houston, Pastor Bill advised that this matter needed to be dealt with by one of the elders of the church, and he transferred the call to George Agajanian. Mad Dog proceeded to explain to George that a woman had approached him during one of his ministry sermons and advised him that her son had been sexually abused as a child by Frank Houston. Mad Dog accused Hillsong of covering this up, I think he'd been talking about abuse. The lady came to the front afterwards and said, Frank Houston abused my son. I, I can't even begin to tell you. It, it, it kind of came at me at degrees, first of all. I, I couldn't get past the fact he was talking about, you know, a, a man, a, a, per, a, a boy. And it kind of hit me at degrees that, first of all, it, that's, that's kind of homosexual. And the second thing that, uh, it was like someone under eight. I, I, by God's grace, in the middle of it was clear enough in my mind to know what I can do and what I can't do and everything in you wants to protect your own father. But I did what I had to and I took it to our denomination, which I led, and they asked me to stand aside from the investigation and they investigated it fully and uh, the end result was he never preached, he never ministered, he was never in leadership again. George assured him that he had never heard of such an allegation about Frank Houston and that there was no cover up and that he would investigate the matter. That afternoon, George had a meeting with Pastor Brian Houston, senior pastor of Hillsong Church at the time, where he informed Brian, who's Frank's son, of the allegation. Brian was shocked by the allegation concerning his father and advised George that he had never heard anything to that effect previously. Frank Houston was away overseas for several weeks at the time and upon his return, Brian, his son, confronted him with the allegation. Frank went so far as to confirm the allegations were true, but that it related to an event that happened over 30 years earlier. At that stage, you certainly knew that there were that very serious allegations had been made against your father. Yes, I did. And that the allegations were likely to be criminal conduct of one Yes, I did. I didn't have any doubt that it was criminal conduct. Yeah, wrongly, I genuinely believed that uh, I would be preempting the the uh, victim if I were to just call the police uh, at that point. Over the course of the next 12 months, a second allegation was received by Brian. So maybe 12 or 18 months later, a, a psychologist actually from New Zealand made an appointment to see me. I met him downtown, I had a feeling this was going to be bad news as well. And he went on and told me a similar story about when he was 14. 
He met with the individual accuser for coffee in the city, and the accuser told Brian that Frank had abused him in New Zealand as a minor. Over the ensuing months, another allegation was brought to their attention from New Zealand, all of which was new information to them, and neither Brian nor the senior team of Hillsong Church had any prior knowledge. By now, the matter had been referred to the ACC. As Brian Houston was the president of the ACC at the time, the ACC had asked him to remove himself from the matter as Frank was his father, and they wanted to allow for a thorough investigation. According to George, Frank immediately stepped down from all ministry at the church, and the matter was referred to the Australian Christian churches. October 1999 was the fateful day where I was having a meeting in my office with one of my colleagues, and he went on to tell me that someone had rung into our church office and had made a complaint that 30 years before my father had abused a, a boy. First I'm thinking, that, that's immoral. And then within a split second I'm thinking, that's criminal. You know, tr terribly sad for the victim because there's no doubt about it. My father's, father's violated him and, you know, done irreparable damage to his life. Didn't cover it up. We did tell people straight away. We did make, take his credential off him. He never did preach again. But that's not true. And uh, it's lovely, lovely to be here again. I, this is not the first time I've been in this church, I don't know. I've been here quite a bit over the years and uh, preached here. And so I had to confront my own father and uh, ask him. You had to ask him to step down. Pardon? You had to ask him oh, to yes, step I, down. I had to fire him, yes. Wow. Yeah. And uh, we did oversee and ensure that he was never put in a position to be close to kids to be able to do that again. So you're 22? Oh, I thought you would have looked 23. <laughs> but you're 22. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? Well, we've got one 22-year-old. Anybody younger than that? Of course there is. Look at that. Oh, quite a number. Oh, look at that. You've got a young church here on your hands, uh, which is very wonderful. I'm glad of, you know, see young Ben here this morning uh, growing up and uh, it won't be too long before he'll be bigger than his father and wiser than his father and more anointed than his father because God moves in generations. And my, uh, my son Brian is doing great things for God, you know. What we didn't do is report it to the police. A segment on 60 Minutes Australia paints a much darker timeline of events. In December of 2000, nearly a year after the victims of Frank's heinous crimes came forward with their abuse, a statement was circulated internally throughout Hillsong's leadership team. The church first tried to diminish Frank's child sex crimes as a, quote, serious moral failure. Then they tried to dissolve any responsibility by harping on the statute of limitations, stating that it was over 30 years ago. However, with this came a clause which said that this statement would only be used publicly if rumors became so extensive. According to 60 Minutes Australia, in December of 2001, the past of Hillsong were, quote, made aware of Frank's crimes. To combat this, they stated that they could not see any reason for this to be announced to your church or further afield. The church failed to recognize the imminent threat that serial child offender Frank Houston posed to the Hillsong congregation for far too long and even attempted to give the entire story a positive PR spin. Even if you're not familiar with the Hillsong name, you're probably familiar, <clears throat> excuse me, with their music. For decades, its world-famous praise and worship team have released songs that you can hear in churches across the globe every Sunday. And according to senior pastor Brian Houston, the best is yet to come. In his book, Live, Love, Lead, Brian shares the good times and some of the most disappointing ones he's faced in the last 30 years and reminds us that God can use anything in surprising ways. It talks so much in the book about the, really the incredible story of what God did uh, with Hillsong. You know, I think sometimes people look at someone who has experienced the level of success that you have, God-given though it is, and they think, well, you know, that just happened over a window of time and it's all been wonderful and good, but not without lots of bumps along the way. That's absolutely right. I mean, as I read your book and you tell the story of your father, yes. I mean, my heart just went out to you. Share a little bit of that story. Well, growing up, my dad was uh, a very 
prominent pastor in Your hero, really. Australia, New Zealand, yeah. absolutely my hero. And in fact, I used to watch him go off to preach somewhere. Uh, and I, I, I just always thought one day I want to do that. One day yeah. I want to do that. Uh, yeah, it yeah. was the worst day of my life. I talk about it in my book because, yeah. you know, I just really believe we help people through our tough times and through our good times. Yeah. And so I had to confront my own father and uh, ask him. You had to ask him to step down. Pardon? You had to ask him oh, to yes, step I, down. I had to fire him, yes. Wow. Yeah. I can't think of too much worse than finding out that your father was a paedophile. And so, yeah, it's still, it's still an ongoing journey, but I've never doubted the grace of God. I've never, ever doubted that God is bigger, that God is greater, and that he could sustain me. And so that's what keeps you going forward. One of Frank's victims says the church community made him feel like it was his problem. He said, I've received absolutely no support, no counseling, not even an apology or an acknowledgement of the abuse. My name's Brett Sandstock. I appeared at the Royal Commission as AHA. That was my pseudonym. And, uh, and now I stand before you with who I really am. I'm tired of people speaking for me and telling the world how I felt and how I'm feeling. Now I'm telling the world how I really do feel. And how is that? Pretty annoyed. Pretty annoyed. And, um, not going away just yet. I could not speak, I couldn't scream, I couldn't push back, I just went rigid and I couldn't breathe. I was petrified. Did he say anything to you? You know, you're my golden boy and you're special to me and all these sort of things, which as an adult now I look back at, it makes me want to vomit. Frank's abuse continued until Brett was 12. Terrified of telling his family, he bottled it up. Finally, at the age of 16, he told his mum. Her response was shattering. She turned around and said to me that you don't want to send people to hell and, uh, and stop sending them to the church. Her first reaction was that this would cause trouble. Yes. For the church. For the church. I would have expected some godly uh, assistance, some, some help, maybe some counselling. It's just like it's been brushed under the carpet. I believe that Brian, that's Frank's son, the founder's son, and the other elders of Hillsong Church kept the abuse as quiet as they could, and they have not been held accountable. So here's where we start to tie back into the Britney stuff. According to former members of Hillsong, Hillsong first helped congregants struggling, this is how they put it, struggling with their sexuality, pray the gay away in exit ministries started by Frank Houston or Mercy Ministries for lesbians. So we are, we are getting these girls in here and we have to flush out all the stuff that's been put in them that are just lies and that's part of what we do at Mercy. We tell them the curse is broken in Christ. We tell them that that um, you know we that the word of God you need to renew your mind you need to play, replace the lies with the truth of what God says about you. And then we tell them that soul, spirit hurts. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And then where there's areas, we deal with areas of demonic oppression. If there's demonic activity, like if somebody's opened themselves up to a spirit of through pornography or through lots of promiscuous sexual activity or something like that, then we've opened the door for demonic powers. And, and secular psychiatrists want to medicate things like that but jesus did not say to medicate a demon he said to cast them out and that's supposed to be a part of normal christianity according to a 1993 newspaper ad that appeared in a nashville newspaper for mercy ministries mercy ministries was established in 1983 as an outreach to troubled girls since opening its doors in 1983, the outreach had cared for over a thousand girls. The ministry had operated two homes at the time, one in Louisiana and one in Nashville, Tennessee, where the corporate offices were located. During and after college, Nancy had spent eight years working for the state of Tennessee. She spent the first five years working at a state correctional facility for juvenile delinquent girls, meaning a child prison. In the final three years, investigating child abuse cases and supervising 
using foster care placements. After those eight years of secular work in social services for the state of Tennessee, Nancy was appointed director of women for Nashville Teen Challenge, where she then worked for two years. Nancy, in that article, claimed to have seen many of God's miracles over the last 12 years as troubled girls had had the power of God deliver them from things such as drugs, alcohol, abuse, prostitution, eating disorders, severe depression, vital tendencies, lesbianism, <laughs> and other problems related to physical and sexual abuse. So it's really interesting that she implied lesbianism was a problem at all, but in, in, in any event, it was related to sexual abuse. That's weird. Anyway, Mercy Ministries was able to establish homes for their practices across the world, including St. Louis, Missouri, Monroe, Louisiana, and Nashville, Tennessee, while remaining relatively under the radar. However, what Nancy Alcorn didn't predict was the Australian media derailing her conversion practices through the power of public opinion. In 2008, the Sydney Morning Herald published an article destroying Hillsong's hurtful practices. They started off by saying, a secretive ministry with direct links to Gloria Jean's coffees in the Hillsong Church has been deceiving troubled young women into signing over months of their lives to a program that offers scant medical or physical care, instead using Bible studies and exorcisms to treat mental illness. The article went on to say, government agencies such as Centerlink have also been drawn into the controversy as residents are required to transfer their benefits to Mercy Ministries. There are also allegations that the group receives a payment to look after the young women. Mercy Ministries says 96 young women have graduated from its program since its inception in 2001. Now remember, this was from a 2008 article, but many have been expelled without warning and with no follow-up or support. Three former residents who have felt the full force of Mercy's questionable programs are blowing the whistle on its emotionally cruel and medically unproven techniques. Detailing their abuse, including exorcism, separation contracts between girls who became friends, and harsh discipline for those who broke the rules. Naomi Johnson, Rhiannon Canham Wright, and Megan Smith went into Mercy Ministries Independent Young Women and came out broken and suicidal. Believing, as Mercy staff had told them repeatedly, that they were possessed by demons and that Satan controlled them. Only careful psychological and psychiatric care over several years brought them back from the edge. Mercy Ministries claims to offer residents support from psychologists, general practitioners, dietitians, social workers, and career counselors. These claims are made on its website, and the programs are promoted through Gloria Jean's cafes throughout Australia. But these former residents say no medical or psychological services were provided. Just an occasional monitored trip to a general practitioner, where the consultation takes place in the presence of a Mercy ministry staff member or volunteer. Instead, the program is focused on prayer, Christian counseling, and expelling demons from in and around the young women who say they begged Mercy Ministries to let them get medical help for the conditions they were suffering. These conditions included bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, and anorexia. When the Herald in 2008 asked Mercy Ministries representatives whether they told young women that the symptoms of their mental illness or eating disorders were due to demonic activity and that the residents were forced into exorcisms, Mercy offered no denial. Mercy Ministry staff address the issues that the residents face from a holistic, client-focused approach. Physical, mental, emotional. The program is voluntary and all aspects are explained comprehensively to the residents and no force is used. Throughout its website, decorated in hot pink tones with images of happy young women who have been saved, Mercy claims to offer its residential programs free. Yet the services are not free. Young women on unemployment benefits are, quote, asked to sign them over to Mercy, while others are asked to make donations for expenses. Mostly funded by Gloria Jean's Coffee, which said last night it did not plan to change its sponsorship arrangements, and supported by the Hillsong Foundation, Mercy Ministry says it has a 90% success rate, but when asked to provide evidence of the program's outcomes, Ms. Watson said the research was underway and not yet available. Not only does Mercy Ministries appear unconcerned by the allegations, it is mounting an aggressive expansion campaign. Peter Irvine, its former managing director, now director of corporate sponsorship, confirmed it was opening houses in Adelaide, Perth, Townsville, Newcastle, and another Sydney house in the southern suburbs, but not if the Sydney Morning Herald had anything to do with it. 
journalist Ruth Pollard would continuously expose the church over the next year, continuing on writing. When Mercy Ministries says it helps young women with life-controlling issues, it means in part that it aims to teach them not to be lesbians. Mercy Ministries is keen to ensure there is no lesbianism under its roof, as it's in line with the Hillsong Church's strict doctrines teaching that homosexuality is an affliction that can be cured. The Sydney Morning Herald uncovered. On its application form, Mercy Ministries even went so far as to ask young women if they had been involved in lesbianism, next to the question on whether they had been involved in pro a former resident who did not wish to be identified said girls were asked on the application form, as well as in a telephone interview, if they had ever had a lesbian or bisexual relationship. They asked if I had been involved with drug abuse, witchcraft, or lesbianism. They bunched them together like that. When people were gay or lesbian at Hillsong, they were sent to services. Then, conveniently, one of the services for the gay men that the people got sent to, when this man who started it was credibly accused of abuse, Frank. He starts one called Exit Ministries, but he's abusing boys. Think about that. But when it was for lesbians, I guess, because he didn't you know, have any interest in that, they sent him on to Mercy Ministries. Now, what do we know about Mercy Ministries? Mercy Ministries has very strong ties to Lou Taylor. Jamie Lynn Spears even almost went to Mercy Ministries. She said it in her book. The news that 16-year-old Jamie Lynn Spears is pregnant came as a shock to most. How mad must Nickelodeon be right now? All I can tell you is I went there, I think in September to do an interview, and there was a list of restrictions of what I could and could not ask her like a mile long. And I'm sorry, but you guys are wrong. They're, they're freaking out right now. They're not gonna try, it's Nickelodeon. They, you know, they're not gonna try to cover this up. They're, they're, either, it's, they're either gonna deal with it or dump her. Eventually, Jamie Lynn says she was sent away to a remote cabin somewhere in the snowy northeast to avoid the news. No phone, no contact with the outside world for weeks. That time was, I felt, it felt like you're almost like suffocating. It was just like, I can't, I, I felt like, what was I going to do? I was a kid and maybe this isn't my best interest and maybe this is what I'm supposed to do because of course I don't want to be, you know, hounded by the paparazzi or the tabloids or allow them to control my narratives, but it felt like I was really being alienated. We grew up really Christian yeah. and our kids are raised that way. Mm -hmm. We read the Bible with them daily. I had no idea that you guys were such um, hardcore Christians. Yeah. We don't do anything for ratings. A TV show in more countries than the Peace Corps and a collective fortune bigger than the Kennedy. But all of our 60 agencies have a booming business because not everybody who is gay wants to be. Jesus is the top, my top, top, top. Is it a ploy to sell records or to start something much bigger than that? 